Good evening and thanks for tuning in. My name is John Leopold. I'm your county supervisor and uh, we're going to spend an hour tonight talking about law enforcement July 4th uh, and other things going on in Santa Cruz County. Um, uh, we have a great guest tonight, uh, Chris Clark, who's our chief of operations for the sheriff's office and I'll introduce him a little bit more in a, in a moment. Uh, I just want to fill you in on a couple of different issues, a slight COVID uh, update. Uh, as you know, the, uh, our health officer, Dr. Gail Knoll, um, has been working very hard uh, to uh, keep us all safe. Uh, Santa Cruz County has some of the lowest rates of uh, virus transmission in the state of California. And although uh, with our recent reopenings, we've seen an uptick in cases, uh, we, which we expected because as more people are more are together more often, uh, you would expect that they would uh, transmit this virus. Um, it has been fairly localized in South County, uh, and it's mainly uh, transmitted through family contact. So this is a good time to remember as we head into the July Fourth weekend, and that it's going to be important for no matter how much you miss your friends or it's a July 4th tradition uh, to get together with family and friends, that it's important to keep a safe physical distance uh, and it's important uh, to wear face mask if you're inside uh, at all with people uh, and you should wash your hands and not touch your face. Uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, graduations have led to lots of uh, new uh, infections here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, we are watching the numbers very carefully, and I'm sure we're going to talk about uh, tonight a little bit about what's going to be happening on July 4th, uh, and it's something we're all going to be uh, uh, watching. Uh, we did experience our third death uh, that's list listed as related to COVID. Uh, this is somewhat controversial because it was an elderly gentleman uh, in his 90s already in hospice uh, that had lots of other uh, health issues. But he also had COVID, and in conversations with the state, the state says you have to count that as a COVID uh, death, and so we did. Um, and it's also just a reminder that there are uh, people with other comorbidities um, that are at risk. And so when you wear a face mask, you're not protecting yourself, you're protecting everybody else you run into because you don't know what their risk level is and maybe you're carrying this virus and you're asymptomatic and that face mask is, a, is the difference maker between you getting someone sick and uh, obviously the worst case scenario is uh, someone dying. Uh, the county health officer will be uh, uh, holding uh, press conferences. I don't think we're gonna have one tomorrow, uh, probably have one next week and I'll be posting on my Facebook page when that happens. I'm happy to answer questions about that and about the county's response uh, to COVID uh, as we've uh, seen uh, some change in the dy dynamics here in Santa Cruz County. But tonight we have Chris Clark. Uh, Chris is the Chief of Operations uh, for the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office. He's been in Santa Cruz 15 years uh, and he's been involved in many different aspects of the Sheriff's operation from uh, public outreach to the jails to now uh, chief of operations. Uh, he's gonna be able to tell us about the plans that we have for July 4th. Uh, any year uh, around July 4th, we always spend a lot of time thinking about the kind of coverage that we have. And this year with July 4th falling on a Saturday, uh, it just all the more of a struggle. Combine that with the COVID uh, crisis, uh, it, it, it means that there has to be extra thought put into what's going on. Um, Chris has been a, uh, is very articulate and can tell you about some of the ways in which we're preparing and then we'll answer questions about that or other law enforcement issues uh, if you're interested. Chris, I wonder if you just start tonight, tell us a little bit about yourself and then tell us about what's happening on July 4th. Sure, so as Supervisor Leopold mentioned, uh, my name is Chris Clark. I've been with the Sheriff's Office about, uh, about 15 years, kind of uh, my dad worked in, with the military and then as a military contractor. So I've kind of had the, the privilege of living in kind of all over the, all over the world and in, in, in the U.S. From, from Egypt to Japan throughout the United States. Uh, and I landed here, my, uh, my uncle was actually working for UCSC as a campus police officer uh, up for UCSC. 
And uh, I graduated uh, college from Sac State. He said, hey, the sheriff's office is a great place to work and, and you should really apply. And so I did. And um, I was here for about two years. And, and uh, my, my family at the time was living in, in Roseville near, Sac near Sacramento. And so uh, I thought that, you know, that doing this, doing this line of work would be similar, you know, and it'd be better on my family potentially if I moved north. So I, re I actually lateral to the Sa uh, Sacramento Sheriff's Office but I was there not long and, and didn't have any issues, but uh, really I just, I missed the county. Uh, it's a great community to work in. Our, our office is, 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 a, is a great uh, great office to work with and for. And so it was just a really good fit for me. And so the way we do policing here at the sheriff's office, it, it's in line with, with exactly why I got into this line of work. And so I, I'm super proud of, uh, of our office and the progressiveness that, uh, that the, the sheriff part is, is implemented here. And so I, uh, I couldn't be more proud of us, and that's that's the reason that that uh, that, I, I, that I came back, and that's why I uh, why I love living here and uh, and working here. That's a little bit about me. In terms of the Fourth of July, what what you're going to see is, is kind of much different than in years past. So um, you know, in in we'll we'll have more staff working this weekend than we will have had in any of the previous years. Uh, it, just making sure that we have enough visibility. And that we're really doing uh, what I see as three things, and that's education, uh, mitigation, and then enforcement of fireworks in other county and 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 and, uh, and, and statutes. So that that's what we'll be doing, and, and we'll be doing that Friday to Sunday. So Friday, uh, for example, to give you kind of more detail, we'll have 22 deputies uh, working just beach enforcement. That's not including the folks working patrol. And so what that looks like uh, for our central district is essentially from from Sunny Cove to basically Opal Cliffs is, is a series of fixed positions that are at our highest used beaches. So uh, Sunny Cove, Moran, Corcoran, uh, Pleasure Point, and The Hook. What you'll see on Friday is, is, is deputies at those positions. They can move around, but, but they're really tied there to make sure that we're contacting people, we're educating them about what they can and can't do, and at the same time looking for larger problems and, and mitigating those issues before they become uh, larger issues. And then amongst uh, those fixed positions, we have uh, roving teams that can kind of move around and, and really address more specific problems. So uh, it, it's kind of a twofold uh, enforcement plan there, but a lot of resources, a lot of visibility. And so I, I really feel good about, about the number of people that we're going to have out there and basically uh, making sure that we're all staying as safe uh, as we can to enjoy the, to enjoy the weekend. Sure, and so we also put out, uh, there's going to be signage that's out there, and uh, are we trying to let people know about uh, about increased fines? What are we doing around that area? That's that's correct. So there, the signage that you typically see on the 4th of July, uh, those signs went up. Uh, I want to say County Rose was putting those up today. We did some outreach on social media, so we, we did that, which we've done in, in years past. And, uh, and so we've got those pieces that are working for us, working for us now. Yeah, I know that when I talked to Jason Hoppin, our public information officer, that the that the social media reach of the county's Facebook pages or county social media accounts and the sheriff media, social media accounts are greater than the subscription base of the uh, Santa Cruz Sentinel. So it's definitely uh, effective. Um, are, are there increased fines this year? There are. So that uh, the, the section for fireworks and, and those type of uh, those types of county code issues, there is that increased uh, fine uh, for the seven days uh, preceding the 4th of July and then the seven days following the 4th of July. So that, that's in place and, and that'll continue through the weekend. Uh, well, this week, through the weekend and then the week following. Great, great. Uh, and um, in years past, there's been uh, gates or fences or other things at beaches. Would we expect to see something like that this year? No, you know, what we found with doing a lot of that is, is it really, it, 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 it creates this egress and ingress issue. And so right. um, people were going around that stuff anyway. It, it really made it harder uh, to get in, and get in and out of there, especially if you wanted to get a number of people down there. So uh, it wasn't that effective. What I think is effective is, is these fixed positions, especially this weekend, and having deputies there greeting people and then letting them know what, you know, what to expect and what they can and can't do. Uh, Chris, if someone's in their neighborhood and they see someone setting off fireworks, who do they call and what should they expect? Yeah, call you know call our dispatch line, which is 471-1121. We have a deputy, actually a sergeant, that'll be assigned up at our dispatch center 
we'll be evaluating those calls. Um, you know, specifically what we're looking for there is, is making sure if you see the person or you can identify them or you can tell us specifically who's doing it, that, that's ultimately what we're looking for. I mean, the problem that we get into in the, in, with, with some of these calls is it, it's really hard for us to figure out who exactly did it. And that, that comes down to who do we, then who are we enforcing this section on? And so uh, fireworks will go up, we'll see them, but then the reality is who, who did that? And so that's, that's what we're trying to answer. And sometimes that can get difficult, but if you have information uh, like that, like, hey, it's this person, here's what they're wearing, or uh, here's, where they, here's where they live or they're at, uh, then that, that information's helpful. Great. Great. Um, we got some questions, and so I want to I want to get to them. If you do want to ask a question, there's a Q and A function at the bottom of your screen, um, and you can just write a question in there, and and we'll try to get to them all tonight. Um, Chris, so starting uh, right off, uh, someone says fireworks have been going already every night at Sunny Cove. Um, uh, has there been any response there? And is uh, is there going to you said that there's going to be officers stationed there? What hours will they be there? Yeah, that's correct. So this weekend, and as those calls come in, I mean, again, if you know where they're coming from, if you know who's doing it, definitely let us know. Uh, we want to, you know, we want to be able to help uh, with that. Uh, this weekend, the, there'll be a deputy there, one deputy on Fridays, and sp speaking specifically to Sunny Cove, you'll see one there Friday from noon to midnight. And then on Saturday on the 4th, there'll be two deputies there noon to midnight. And then and there'll be one on Sunday. So we'll... Uh, but for that full 12 hour period. And then again, a number of people roaming around looking for, uh, looking for other issues. That's great, that's great. Um, there's an, another question uh, about uh, that Central Fire is uh, said on next door that the beaches will be closed at 10 p.m. Is that true? Is it, uh, do we close the beaches? No, no, technically not. So the, the, the beaches aren't, aren't closed. Um, and again, that, it, that goes back to the the, the health order where the res, the restrictions on the beaches were were opened back up. You know, speaking towards that, um, you know, while the while public health manages that aspect of of those rules, um, I can provide a little insight with what we were seeing. Um, but especially now with the governor opening things up for tourism, it's really hard to keep things closed like that. At yeah. least that's what I was. It's what I've been told. And so I, I can speak to some of our the the, the experience we had. On the enforcement side of things, if 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 you if that's what you're looking for, surprise. Yeah, no, that that's helpful. That's very helpful. And just so people know, next Wednesday we'll have uh, folks here from the Central Fire District talking about their uh, fire plans for the summer, as well as some big changes that are going on with the organization of Central Fire and their consolidation with the Aptos La Selva District and what that's going to mean for uh, people in the first district. So I hope you'll tune in next Wednesday at six o'clock. Um, Chris, uh, 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 John uh, wrote a question here that says, what actionable steps are law enforcement agencies taking in Santa Cruz County to ensure that officers wear face coverings when they interact with the pu public to maintain a safe social physical distance from, uh, from people? Yeah, we do that here at our office. So, I mean, we have, you know, all of our staff is, is, given, P is given PBE mask gloves. Uh, to make sure to, to wear when they're interacting in the public for, for both parties protection uh, here at the office. I mean, just you know, even our uh, the systems we have in place, each one of our every one of our staff members is, is medically checked when they come in, their, their temperatures sure. checked. Uh, we're, we're making sure that nobody's if they are sick, they're not showing up here. And then we're catching things if, if they if, if they're not, if they say un un unknowingly show up and find they have a low grade fever, they're going home. So we've done a number of things to try to better protect both our staff and the public. Yeah, but we've been very fortunate that uh, very few of the officers have uh, have uh, have contracted uh, COVID-19. Um, That's correct. And we've also been encouraging people to get tested through public health. So we've right. been we've been working with public health on that. Any one of our employees, uh, we, we encourage them to go down and get tested. And so um, and then so far we have not seen anybody yet that that's had uh, any sort of positive RNA for, for COVID. Good, that's really good. Uh, uh, Judy writes in that fireworks are going uh, every night in Live Oak already. What happens after the 4th? Um, they have fireworks going off on all summer. Who do they call and what do yeah. they expect to happen? Yeah, call the same, call that same number, that 471-1121 number, which is our dispatch. 
uh, and, and again, the more information, the better, because it, it, you know, and, and I, I live here in town as a, as a lot of us do. And so uh, as we see this stuff, if we can determine where it's coming from, our, our options are greater when it comes to the enforcement of stuff. So uh, Allison writes, uh, many of us locals are terrified. 36 hours after Dr. Noel opened the beaches, a graph showing how the spike will be devastating to us the next few weeks went up on the county website. We were able to keep the beaches clear during the SIP. Why not now when we need it most? Is it too late to change this to save us? And I I'll take this and uh, Chris, if, uh, if there's things you wanna add. You know, we put the limited beach closure in place um, uh, or Dr. Newell put the, the limited beach closure in place uh, as a way to discourage visitors from outside the area and, and say that we are not ready uh, for visitors uh, just yet. And it worked pretty well um, for a long time. Uh, we started to see that other jurisdictions stopped uh, uh, doing enforcement. State parks told us they would not enforce. Uh, we saw big crowds amassing on, on the city of Santa Cruz Beach. and um, and it became much more difficult with the interactions that we were having with uh, community members, deputies were having with community members on the beach. And uh, I don't think we were gonna arrest people for, uh, for sunbathing on the beach, uh, but it really put an unfair, uh, unfair situation and a difficult situation for our deputies. Uh, when the governor uh, allowed the reopening of hotels and vacation rentals, um, then it's harder and harder to keep people from outside the area uh, to our community. Uh, what we know is that we've, as I said, we've expected to see spikes in the number of cases as we open things up. Um, uh, but what we haven't seen so far is we haven't seen a spike that we could tie to uh, visitors creating new vectors. Most uh, of the uh, new infections have been spread through family contacts. There was those family gatherings. Um, and the, ask, the actual risk of transmission at the beach is quite low. And so when it became difficult to enforce, when, it, when the governor was promoting tourism, uh, when he opened up the hotels uh, and the other jurisdictions weren't enforcing it, a um, uh, decision was made that we weren't gonna do it here in Santa Cruz. Now we are looking at the material, we are looking at the demographics and epidemiology of this disease on a regular basis. And uh, just this past Tuesday, the board met with our health officer and the sheriff uh, to go over this information, to see if we needed a, a change in strategy. Um, and right now we're holding it the way it is. And with having so many officers at the beach, I, uh, Chris, maybe you could speak to uh, the experience that deputies were facing. and what we could expect deputies to be doing around face coverings, social distancing, large groups on the beach this weekend. Sure, so, you know, in, in just discussing that, you know, there, there's a lot of us, uh, most of us live here in the county. We want things to be safe. We, uh, we want things safe for our families. We, we feel the same way as everyone else does. The difficult thing for us is, it, it, with, with regards to the enforcement aspect of things, um, well, taking a step back, our approach, uh, based on what we saw, which to give you an idea, when we were doing a lot of the enforcement, we were writing shelter in place tickets. It, it, it was a, a willingness of people really to go along with what we were what we were asking, which was that hey, you're on the beach, you shouldn't be, and here's a citation um, for violating that shelter in place order, and you know you sign at the bottom. And what we saw was that that slowly eroding away to where our deputies were running into people. To, you know, hey, the beach is closed, and then the conversation would go something like this, hey, the beach is closed, yeah, I know, um, okay, well, I, I don't want to have to write you a ticket, but you need to leave, uh, well, I'm not going to leave, and so, uh, okay, well, I, my option is really to give you a citation now, and then they would say something back to the effect of, well, I'm not going to sign the citation, and quite frankly, uh, with everything that's going on right now, you, uh, you frankly don't want to take me, or you're, essentially drag me to your police car because that would look terrible for you and look terrible for the county. Yeah. And so that anti, uh, you know, then there is that anti-police rhetoric that's happening, happening nationally. So trying to, you know, find what's the best balanced approach if people are unwilling to really, and that, that term not, you know, not wanting to be governed is really what we were, we were seeing some of. And, and these sure. sort of situations, you know, we don't want to be in a position where we're 
dragging people to a patrol car. We did that. That, that's, that would be that would be bad for us, bad for the bad for the county. But you know, at the same time, wanting to educate people and really have them understand, hey, this is important, and you know, uh, important for a number of reasons. So here, here's what we'd like you to do, and and so and then at the same time, so that's the education piece I was referring to, and then in terms of mitigating problems, you know, catching them before they start. Hey, there's no alcohol on the beach. You can't drink on the beach. So. Uh, if you're going down there with that, leave it in the car. You know, don't don't do that. Or if we ha if we see those sorts of things happening that somehow got biased, which they might, it, it's catching on to that and going down there and contacting those people and asking them to remove that or leave the beach entirely if they're creating an issue. Or uh, write them a, uh, issue a citation for you know it could be anything from possession of fireworks to a county code violation of uh, possession of alcohol um, or to that sort of thing. So. That's kind of what we're what what we've seen, and kind of what we're going to do uh, in a nutshell. Sure, that's helpful. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Judy writes that there's been an issue for years. Why aren't we doing something like Seaside has done with larger fee citation and rewards with coupons for turning in people doing fireworks? So we do have we do have extra fines. Could you explain how what the extra fines are? And have we thought about uh, tools to get people to turn in others with fireworks? So that, I mean, that's an interesting, that's an interesting uh, uh, suggestion. It, 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 I mean, maybe somebody wanted to turn in fireworks here at the, at the sheriff's office, uh, we would gladly take them. I think fire is set up something similar uh, as well. But, um, but in terms of the fine, it, yeah, up to upwards of $1,000 if, if potentially somebody's uh, found to be violating this. And so that, uh, hopefully provides a significant deterrent for someone who's thinking about lighting a mortar off, say on Pleasure Point, and us being there, which we will be, uh, and seeing this person do that, and uh, and then issuing them a citation for that. So hopefully that you know that monetary impact provides enough of a deterrent that people kind of think twice. Uh, but again, we're going to be more visible than what we ever are, at least that we have been in the recent past, in the recent years. And so we're going to be out there, and we're going to be looking for those sorts of things. And we know the, and we know the, you know, the, the spots, which Pleasure Point, um, you know, between ple the Pleasure Point Market and the Hook. I mean, you're going to see, you're going to see us in that area. And so if somebody's found to be violating that, they're going to get a ticket. I think Judy was also asking, uh, provide incentive for people to turn in others with fireworks. You know, so if if I see my neighbor's got a bunch of fireworks, is there an incentive for me to turn him in? Yeah, probably not. I mean, there, that's a that's problematic to a certain extent. But uh, you know, we would hope that if you saw someone or you know of this issue going on, that provides a fire hazard or a public safety issue, which that's what we're getting at, right? We're getting a, you know a quality of life problem. I mean, it's illegal to begin with, but a quality of life problem for pets, uh, for us trying to sleep at night, while, while at the same time hoping that it doesn't touch off a wildfire or or a home or a fire at a home. Or, or cause somebody or, or some uh, some child injury. Um, we'd hope that if you saw those sorts of things going on, that you'd get us involved and, and, and give us as much information you have so we can go in there and Great. take care of that. Um, well, this is a first, uh, the, I represent the first district, but people tune in from all over the place, uh, Chris. And someone asked, will there, uh, Alicia asked, will there be extra coverage in San Lorenzo Valley, Lampico, Ziani? So we do have patrol. So when I mentioned we've got uh, we've upstaffed our beach enforcement, we do have a, a, a large number of people that will be working patrol um, throughout that area. Uh, and if there is an issue up there, we'll divert resources as we need it. So um, we, the, it's almost like an all hands on deck sort of uh, approach to this weekend. So if there is an issue up in uh, say Ziani, Lampico, Bonnie Dune, uh, we can divert resources up there to handle you know whatever we need to. Great. Um, someone asked, uh, Michael asked, will Cochrane Lagoon Beach have the same number of officers as Sunny Cove? Corcoran? Uh, yeah, in fact, they will. So, uh, and again, those those people be there, but, you know, again, with the same purpose, you know, uh, educate. But the short answer, yes. Uh, uh, Fred asked, in the past, CHP has been around during the 4th of July. Uh, will there be other agencies supporting the Sheriff's Department this 4th? Yeah, we've coordinated with the other cities. In fact, we had a meeting today, which included fire. We, we've coordinated with all of them. And so we've reviewed their plans. They have our plans. So, you know, those coastal jurisdictions, uh, Capitola, uh, Watsonville, 
uh, Santa Cruz and uh, and state parks. We've been in communication with them so that we're all on the all on the same page with regards to what we're all doing. And they're there to back each other up if some if something gets right. out of hand. Yep. Uh, so uh, John asks, uh, how are we controlling excessive out of towners parking in our neighborhoods? And uh, I don't know whether I could add a few things. Um, you know, we have tried to uh, have a better enforcement of our live oak parking program this year. Um, and we've seen a lot more uh, violations and tickets, uh, and we've uh, generated a lot more tickets this year. We are looking at two things. Um, uh, one, about expanding the live oak parking program uh, that would in include the Opal Cliffs Court Drive area. And then uh, we're in the final stages of a, something we call a slow streets program. Uh, I, on July 15th, uh, we'll have the, the, the meeting will actually be a community meeting and talk about the Pleasure Point, which will be the first place that we try to do these slow streets program, which is really blocking off some streets to local traffic only. Um, we've been working with uh, Ecology Action, Bike Santa Cruz County, and members of the Pleasure Point community to identify some streets where we think we could make a difference and to keep it to local traffic only. Um, this could be a way that we uh, do this in the future and expand it out to other neighborhoods. Um, if it's successful, uh, we could get it going pretty quickly. We'll be having meetings in August about the expansion of a parking program, which once we get agreement from the community, we go to the Coastal Commission and we have to get their permission uh, for. I'm not sure if there's anything else, Chris, that you want to add about uh, parking and neighborhoods. Yeah, and I mean, we'll be looking for that too. So parking enforcement, I mean, there's there's issues we know about. People like to park illegally. Sunny Cope's one of them. So if we see that, uh, our folks are going to be armed with a, a parking uh, citation book as equally as they'll have uh, their notice to appear book for county code and other violations. So uh, yeah, we're going to be doing both. And you usually don't write too many parking tickets, but uh, on a weekend like this, you'd be writing parking tickets as well as citations. Yep, right? that's correct. Um, so Mark B. Uh, uh, writes a question. I'm a local uh, planning on going to the beach on Friday. As far as I know, the beaches are open. Are they plan Are there any planned measures that he, that he needs to know about for the third? And I don't think there's any special issues. Don't bring alcohol. Don't bring fireworks. Uh, uh, it, you should stay with your family household and not be part of a group of people you don't live with. Um, that's going to be important as well. Correct. I don't yep. think there's anything else there. No. Nope. Great. Um, Melissa asks, with the governor's closures of the state parks and beach parking lots uh, that he announced today, how will that affect Santa Cruz? What do we, what would we expect to see here in Santa Cruz? Yeah, frankly, I think closing the parking lots, we're, we could see potentially, it's an access issue. And so yeah. the state parks beaches are going to be open, but the parking lots will be closed. What that'll look like is, I, I mean, I venture to say that if you can't get into the parking lot at, at, at Panther or someplace like that, or or, um, or Twin Lakes, maybe you'd want to go to you'd want to try to access Sunny Cove or find another spot. But at the same time, we're going to have people there. Uh, you know, hopefully, not hopefully, but we will have people there, and they'll be looking for issues. So, uh, yeah, I think there's going to be an impact, unfortunately, on us. Uh, but sure. but we're going to have people there to be able to handle it. Yeah, it's it's slightly frustrating when the state takes these half measures because uh, during this COVID pandemic, they've had uh, uh, state beach parking lots closed, but the beaches are technically open. And so what we find, especially on the North Coast and Highway 1, people park on the highway, creating problems for bicyclists and other motorists. Um, so it doesn't really stop people from coming. It just creates a, a more unsafe situation. And I think we'll see that um, also, when people may choose not to be in that and come to our beaches, then it creates bigger problems for us. That's correct. Um, so, uh, John uh, uh, wants us to start taking pictures of license and sending people tickets like they do uh, when they run a red light in 41st Avenue. Are we considering uh, any kind of that enforcement? No, no. I mean, that type of surveillance, we, we, we wouldn't do that. And so, there, there's, you know, we're, again, we're, we're there. We're focusing on the issues. We're focusing on the problems. We're going to contact people. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I guess you could say old-fashioned police work, but I mean, I I think that it works best in these situations where you got the face-to-face -face with somebody, letting them know what you can and can't do. And if you are doing something wrong, you're you're going to hear that too. So, 
Um, I know that the sheriff has been sensitive about the introduction of new surveillance technology, and he has a policy and process in place when he was going to introduce new technology. Do you want to talk about what he does when he's, uh, uh, in the past when he's introduced these new technologies? Yeah, we've had public meetings. I mean, speaking specifically to our unmanned aerial system program, which we use for specific public safety issues, not for general surveillance, uh, missing people, uh, bomb threats, uh, major public safety problems. That, that's where we're, we're using that type of technology. But that went through a, a public process. Uh, there was a, a public. There were public meetings. There was. Uh, we involved the ACLU in reviewing our policy. Uh, we applied best practices with regards to uh, making sure that you know that that, that was on par with with uh, suggestions from the community. So we 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 went through an entire process that took uh, I want to say it took about six months, and then uh, our policy was reviewed again by the by the ACLU. So we we've, we've done a number of things like that, making sure that we had public input and and using it for uh, for the purposes that that's important to use it for in the situations where we're trying to to help people and uh, and save lives. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, it's there are technologies that can really make a difference, and I think uh, what I've been impressed with Sheriff Hart is he hasn't wanted to, to uh, introduce technology that really cuts into people's privacy, mm -hmm. and so he's created this process where he does a public meeting, he puts out information about how it's going to be used, who's going to have access to it, how long the information is going to be kept, and uh, and what he expects to get from it. And I went to that meeting about the drones and the, the, the exchange between the sheriff's office and the public, I thought was strong and changes were made in the, in, in the usage policy based on what they heard from the community. And I think it's a good model because uh, we're, we live in a surveillance state sometimes and uh, we shouldn't casually move into collecting information about people. We should do that for, in a very public way. So I, I just uh, applaud the sheriff's department. For that. Yeah, I mean the, the sheriff. They, they, that was, I mean his, the 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 model that he used there was was, was super. It, I mean it was great. Uh, very uh, allowing other people to participate. And really that level of transparency again, I, you know that that really. I mean I, you could go to our website right now. You could you could see and that that's in line with the transparency that our office, uh, you know, uh, is is putting out there in terms of. You know, you can look at our stop data. You go to our website right now, there's a link that says transparency. Click on it. You'll see everything uh, that we've done within the last month from stop data to our use of force statistics, calls, where are we going, that sort of thing. So really in line with, with the level of transparency and the, the, the sheriff feels is important. It is important. Yeah, no, it, it's fantastic. It's a really a model for others, and I, I, I applaud those efforts. Um, uh, uh, Chris, uh, Michael writes, uh, will officers confiscate all fireworks they see people have, including safe and sane fireworks? Yeah, fireworks are illegal, so we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna collect those, and so we're gonna confiscate them. So the, the short answer there is yes. Um, it's, uh, someone writes, so we've kind of covered this, in the past there's been designated entry points and exits marked off, will that policy be in effect? We're not gonna be doing that th th this year. We have a different model. Uh, that correct. may be more effective for having more officers out there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, someone asked about whether Opal Cliff Park will have any enforcement. The sheriff has only been spotted there once, said, says John. Uh, well, we've done actually quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of work there in Opal Cliffs, uh, but it is an area that we're going to focus on through the weekend. And so we'll have people checking in there and, and making sure that there aren't the same issues that, uh, or there aren't issues happening. So. So we'll be keeping an eye on Opal Cliffs. Um, so uh, Sonia asks, uh, to add to Judy's question on fines, uh, the county fines up to $1,000, while Seaside is $2,500. Can you be more specific about how you are setting up the fine and why not emulate Seaside and going up to $2,500? Uh, plus Seaside sets a curfew, curfew, which is all fireworks are banned after 10 p.m. Is that something that could be implemented here in the county? Yeah, that really, I mean, it's a it's a board issue. I mean, that's a, it's a that's an issue that goes before the board of supervisors. Uh, you know, it's something that could be discussed, uh, but that's not something necessarily the sheriff's office uh, implements and then takes off from there. So there's a public process behind all of that that likely Seaside did. Um, but so to an answer that question, that the sheriff's office can't just make that happen overnight. That may be a public process. Right, and, and I guess the question is, uh, 
do, do you think there would be any uh, different um, response to someone who's fearful of a thousand dollar fine or someone who's fearful for a twenty five hundred dollar fine? Is I don't think so. I mean, it's a thousand dollars, twenty five hundred dollars. It, it's a that's a, a a decent chunk of chunk of change. I, I think that somebody is going to. I mean. It, I think the effect is the same. It's really, but it's finding the people and identifying who's doing it. That that's the largest issue. And uh, the question of a curfew for fireworks. We we wouldn't have a curfew for fireworks, and we don't allow fireworks at all. That's correct. Right. So we don't uh, we don't need a um, a curfew. Uh, John writes in again uh, about Capitola respecting our privacy. I'm not exactly sure what he's talking about there. Um, uh, um, do you know what the, does Capitola allow fireworks? Has that been an issue in the past? I don't believe so. I'd have to double check that. Um, Alice writes in, uh, she says, do we expect the substations to open again or are they permanently closed? No, we actually, you know, we're, we're hoping, you know, we had to, we, we did a number of things to kind of prepare really for COVID. We, we didn't know what to expect as a sheriff's office. And so, you know, we had to, to plan for potentially uh, staff affected uh, and, and while still providing, you know, public safety here in the county. And so, you know, we had to reel back in some of those resources that were out there. And But there was also the piece of protecting our volunteers, which we're helping sure. staff that. And so uh, we we asked our volunteers to, to, to stay home. But we are, uh, after July 11th, we're going to be uh, placing some of the service center sergeants back into position. Uh, we have a community policing lieutenant who will be addressing and managing the, the community problems within uh, those areas. But again, I would encourage anybody with a problem to definitely uh, call our dispatch number and then we'll have uh, somebody get, get on that. Yeah, at the county, we have worked uh, to allow, to really encourage uh, employees to work at home if that's appropriate for their work, uh, to help reduce the spread of COVID among the, the, work, the workforce. Um, and that has caused some changes. The, most of the public desks uh, and the county are open again, and you could still come to the sheriff's department and, and get help. And of course, someone's gonna answer the phone, uh, but some of our substations are closed because the, the staffing is different. The, the, the officers are on, a, are on a different schedule than they were uh, be, before COVID. Uh, ben writes in, with residents that live in high fire risk areas or high risk fire areas, should they contact the sheriff's office or the fire department if they see fireworks or, God forbid, uh, uh, a fire or smoke? Call 911. I mean, if you see that sort of thing, I mean, it, that's that's an, an emergent issue that we'd want to uh, put resources on as quick as possible. I'd, I'd encourage you to dial 911 if you saw smoke or fire. If, if you're hearing general fireworks, that uh, you could you call the 47, that 471-1121 number to our dispatch to get somebody there. Yeah. And that these are folks I'm sure live in the rural area where the folks are a little bit further away from the sheriff's office. And uh, so I think they're trying to figure out should they call the fire department is that, that acts as, in the same way. Um, uh, Judy is encouraging me to look at increasing uh, fees and giving out the coupons. So maybe that's something we could sit down with the sheriff and figure out if it would really make a change. And sure. if so, it's something that I can follow up and, and put in place for next fire season, um, uh, because the board had our last meeting on Tuesday uh, until uh, August 5th or 6th. And so we won't be meeting again um, until uh, after July 4th. Um, uh, so, so Michael writes in, Capitola's ordinance currently allows safe and sane fireworks on private property. The, the problem is they probably buy them in the city of Watsonville and illegally take them out of the city limits. This means they are in possessions of fireworks on their way from Watsonville to Capitola. Is there anything we do about that? Likely, likely not. I mean, it would depend on, you know, so I think the short answer to that question is, is pretty much, there, there's not a whole lot we can do there. Yeah, well, th there's some other things I, I wanna cover with you, uh, Chris, but I wanna remind people uh, two things. One is if on, if this weekend they see uh, people shooting off fireworks, that they should call 471-1121. Um, and there'll be, there's an officer especially there that will, that is connected to dispatch that can get uh, 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 the patrols in the right place 
uh, to respond to this that there's going to be uh, there's there's increased fines of a thousand dollars and that uh, we have new signage up and we're doing a social media campaign in order to let people know that they're at risk financially uh, as well as possible arrest if uh, if they if they engage in this kind of illegal activity. Um, the other thing I want to talk with you about is is, uh, is you know how the how the force is doing. You know, it just it was um, uh, just about a month ago um, that we experienced the first loss in the line of duty um, since 1983 when uh, Sergeant Damon Gutswiller uh, was killed in the line of duty answering a call. Um, by a guy who was very committed uh, to killing police officers, and uh, that's that's a big hit on uh, on any force. It's, it's particularly ours has gone that long. You know what has been done to, to support uh, officers and their families, and w what have you seen um, in the aftermath of this tragedy? Yeah, a lot of support, and you know a lot of support from the community, which which was great. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we had counselors here for basically round the clock for, for at least a week and then on call after that. We had a number of, uh, of uh, critical incident stress debriefings uh, throughout that week and, and as, well as, as well as with our families. That, that, that's a, another piece of this that, that, that's super important. I mean, making sure that because our families, they, they hear, they, we go home and, and we, we vent to them and we talk to them. And so they, they're, it's like they're doing the work, but they're just, they're not, they're not physically here, but they're affected nonetheless. So, um, you know, we, we, we did things for them, which, and again, it's just supporting, you know, supporting all of us kind of, it's, it's, you know, through that grief process, um, after you lose, after you lose a, you know, a friend, a loved one. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I, I really thought that the, that the entire force banded together and the community really rallied. I mean, I was at, at the, um, Vigil at the at the Center for Public Safety uh, just the day after when all those people were there and it was it was really an outpouring of support um, uh, because uh, the distance between uh, any of us and uh, one of the deputies is 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 not even six degrees of separation. Mm -hmm. um, Damon was the first district resident. Um, there were probably lots of people in my district who knew him and his partner and his kids and um, it's a it's a terrible loss for the community and I just think that that it was great to see the support from uh, other agencies to support the uh, our staff uh, during this difficult time and um, I was glad to hear that uh, 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 Damon's wife had uh, her uh, had their baby uh, over the weekend and She's happy and healthy, and um, and um, may she only hear great stories about her father. So yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Thanks for the good work that you guys do uh, every day. Um, the last area that I just wanted to cover uh, the the board of supervisors um, uh, at our last at our meeting yesterday, we took the final actions on our first version of the budget. Uh, and uh, when I say the first version of the budget is we're legally required to have a budget for today, July 1st. Um, but this year, there's a lot of things we don't know about the budget. Uh, COVID has, has, has done a big hit on some of our primary funding sources, uh, sales tax, transient occupancy tax. Um, it's also generated a lot more expenses. I think we've spent over $14 million since March responding. Um, and there's still a lot more costs down the road, uh, and we also don't know uh, exactly um, uh, what, what the needs are going to be. And so we're going to be coming back in August uh, 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 to do another process when we have better sense of what's happening at the state level and what's happening at the federal level. We're hoping that the federal government actually supports local governments. Um, and. Uh, do you know uh, sort of? Can you talk about some of the some of the changes that had to be made to the to the sheriff's budget? And there were things that were that were um, that were cut because we have to make. I think there were nine million dollars worth of cuts, uh, just like we had to make across all of our, our county departments. Yeah, you know that nine that nine million dollars. You know, it, it, you know that it, it's substantial. You know, in the in the sense of what what potentially that. Uh, 
that means, you know, to our agency. Some things we had to make some, we had, Sheriff had to make some tough choices and that's a, he, he was in a very difficult spot. You know, there, uh, our recovery center was, was a piece of that, but, you know, we want to make sure that we're ensuring that the, the same level of service, same level of public safety, that that wouldn't be affected while, you know, looking at different ways to be able to cut, uh, you know, it, so that we can, you know, make that $9 million mark. But, um, and so the, the recovery center was a piece of that, but uh, we may see that back in the future, but, uh, uh, but little things like that. But in terms of like what, you know, what the public would see out of that, it, I don't think you'd see, you're, you're not going to see any change necessarily. Uh, it, it's a lot of internal stuff, but, uh, um, but you know, may, trying to maintain public safety was, is, is, is our number one goal. Yeah, I think that the sheriff expressed to me that, that his goal was to not lose any deputies because he knows that uh, that is uh, a priority of the community. Uh, right. The priority for uh, public safety, uh, and so the, he's prioritized that over some other things. And um, we're going to have to come back, and we don't know whether how much more we might have to cut. I know that uh, every county employee uh, is going to have a furlough. Uh, uh, law enforcement about five percent, most of the rest of the staff seven and a half percent, and the board of supervisors and the department heads are taking a ten percent cut because we we're trying to. We're, we recognize the hit that this that this has on our county family, and we're trying to limit the number of people that might have to leave uh, because we want to provide services to people. So, um, I guess this is the last question of the night uh, comes from Michael, and he wants to know if the Highway 17 South electronic sign is going to say anything about staying home, no fireworks, uh, or no fireworks in Santa Cruz at a minimum. Yeah, that was part of the plan was, was using that, was using those signs to be able to educate people that came over 17 or came in and out of the county uh, on Highway 1. Uh, I'll double check that, but uh, that was discussed early on. Yeah, I know I met with the CHP commander today and, and they were going to try to see what they could do. Those signs have to be, uh, the, the message has to be over the region. And so they, it's sometimes hard to figure out um, something that works in, uh, on Highway 17 South as well as Los Gatos and well as uh, uh, Gilroy, so um, it's it's tough sometimes to get the same message. Um, Chris, I want to thank you uh, for your work ongoing. Uh, uh, this has been a tough year uh, for all of us. It's been a tough year for the sheriff's department, and I appreciate the work that you guys do every day. It really does make a difference in our community. It's generally pretty safe. I want to let people know that next. Wednesday, I'll have uh, representatives from the Central Fire District to talk about uh, fire season and what we're gonna be doing here in the first district uh, around fire, as well as talking about the merger that they're, uh, that is underway between Central Fire and Atlas La Selva. Uh, I encourage people to check out my Facebook page where I put daily updates and also check out the county webpage uh, for the latest COVID updates. Uh, because I think that's important. If you want to uh, get my newsletter, uh, just text Leopold to 22828. Text Leopold to 22828. Anyway, thanks for uh, uh, coming tonight, and uh, we'll see you next week. Till then. Thank you. Thank you.